All right, everybody, it's Tipsy Elves. That's right, Tipsy Elves. Everyone needs an ugly Christmas sweater this time of year. If you want bragging rights for the most talked about sweater at your Christmas party, listen up. Did you see these guys on Shark Tank a couple weeks ago with their latest update? Everyone is talking about Tipsy Elves. Not in my world. <laughs> and wants their outrageous Christmas sweaters. So I'm sure they are. In the Christmas sweater circles, I'm sure this, this conversation is all a fire. Anyways, talk about your Tipsy Elves sweater and other products you saw on the website. Well, I didn't see any. Trust me when I tell you that these Tipsy Elves Christmas sweaters are like nothing you've ever seen before. They are not for the faint of heart. Nobody's worn these ugly sweaters before uh, before you, so you don't have to worry about finding your size. And you have a ton of styles to choose from. While you're shopping for an ugly sweater, check out the other holiday and collegiate attire for yourself or as a gift like an adult onesie. Dude, what kind of perverts are running this thing? This sounds like... Uh, Shut up, Bill. Just read it. All right. Right now, my listeners get 20% off tipsyelves.com or anything they order on the, their site. Go do this now so they have the best selection to choose from and have it in time for your ugly Christmas sweater party. Go to tipsyelves.com and use the promo code BURR. Who the hell wears an adult onesie? That's like those fucking people that still act like babies. You know what I mean? They have a giant adult crib. Remember that on Opie and Anthony? It was fucking infuriating. Anyways, Merry Christmas, everybody. Oh, it's my favorite. Here we go. Club W, everybody. Club W, tear. My daddy bought me a ranch. Uh, don't you hate when wine looks like a 10, but it winds up looking like a, tasting like a 6? Or even worse, when you walk into the store to pick out your wine, you could easily be fooled into a situation like this. Well, now there's this new wine club. Club W. We knew about ISIS before they did. They've changed everything. No more being fooled by wines that pretend to be hotter or tastier than they actually are. It's easy. Just go to Club W, Club W, W.com, uh, and answer six simple questions. Their algorithm creates a palette profile just for you. Then they send wine directly to your, do to your door, perfectly customized to match your taste. Club W. Fool me once, don't fool me. You're not going to fool me again. Is leading the grape to glass wine revolution. They work directly with the vineyards to cut out the middlemen, which saved you money. So when you go to Club W, smarter than Jib, you get premium wine customized to your taste at a third of what you would pay at the store. They even have a no risk, 100% guarantee that you're going to love what they send you. And right now, when you go to Club Debbie, don't count the votes, is offering my listeners 50% off your first order when you go to Club Debbie. Stop's going to be toast. ClubW.com slash Burr. So stop wasting time and money messing around at retail stores and start drinking wine. Uh, you know you're going to love. Just go to Club Debbie. Jeb's coming. ClubW.com slash Burr to get 50% off your first order. That's ClubW.com slash Burr. I'll just do like a quick little intro here. Sure, man. All right. Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Burr, and it's time for the Thursday afternoon, just before Friday, Monday morning podcast. That I'm just checking in on you. Just checking in on your week here. As mentioned, um, I was going to have a special guest, uh, one of my favorite comedians of all time, and I still think brutally, brutally fucking underrated, uh, Mr. P. Corielli. Um, I've known him since I moved to New York. He's got a new special. Let me get all this shit out of the way. He's got a new special that's streaming on Showtime, kids. God knows you guys like the streaming stuff, all right? It's called Let Me Tell You. Just came out to rave reviews. One of my favorite comics and people of all time, Mr. Pete Corielli. Billy, Billy, I don't even, I don't even know how to take that intro, dude. <laughs> I want to hug you across the table. I, I got to put that in a bio. We should add like a studio audience. Fucking brutally, brutally underrated. It's as if it is. my wife is saying the words in the kitchen. What, did Thank she say you. that? Oh, dude, I swear. I mean, come on. Two weeks before I did the special, before it came out, I was on a, I was on a boat. I was on a cruise. Who's on a cruise? Why? Two weeks before this special comes out. Why? Well, no, you already no, you already you already taped it. You weren't already like, taped. Oh it. my yeah, god! I was yeah, say, dude, yeah. you got balls, man. I'd be free. I, I was two. I thought you were saying two weeks before you taped the fucking thing. 
you were on a cruise. Like, I got this. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Sitting no. there drinking a Bud Light. Can you imagine? No, I mean, I was no, I performing couldn't. on a cruise. I mean, at some point, I would do a joke, and I literally just say, and they sit at the bar and put bread in my jar and say, man, what are you? And they don't yeah. even get it. They don't even get it. Right. But anyway, I appreciate it, dude. What? Uh, let me ask you this. When you go to do a special, like, when do you feel like your hour's ready? <sighs> do you ever? I don't know, man. Yeah, I don't. You know, it's just crazy. The, f- I, it's, the first one I did, I felt a little more like it was ready. Like it was, right. it was like, you know, because I never did your a first one. Just, you're always ready. Cause you've been doing it for fucking ever waiting yeah. for somebody to give you a shot. And I never did a half hour of any kind. So it was really, I had the whole gamut, everything I ever written up until that point. You was never did a half hour for comedy central. No, no. I, I, oh, uh, my at the time, God. well, at the time, by the time it came point, uh, my manager goes, I think we can get you a half hour. I go, I think I can, I got an hour. Yeah. So I laid it down at a club and sent it to them, and they right away gave me the hour. And I felt really great after that. And then this second one was a bit more of a grind, like mm-hmm. really grinding it out. Um, again, you're one of the guys, like, I watch how you're doing it, and, like, you know, and, uh, and Louie, too. And I'm like, how? what are these guys sleeping at night, and elves are writing this shit and yeah. putting a butt foot in their bed? <laughs> I can't keep up. So, but by the end, you know, I I, I really felt it was there. But I got to tell you, man, if I had to wait like six more months to tape that special, I probably would have forgotten what was funny about some of those jokes. That's the thing. So, but you, you, I always have to, you get it right to the point where you're like, dude, I'm so fucking sick of doing this. And then it's like, okay, I got to burn this thing. Yeah. And then uh, move on. So I, I try to do them like just about every other year or so. So this year coming up is the year where maybe towards the end of the year I was going to do it. I was just talking to my guy about it. And, you know, he's going, dude, you're ready. You're ready. I'm like, no, nah, yeah. I, I don't think I, I, I got to make sure there's a few things I want to push a little bit further because because you're competing against your last one. Mm-hmm. So it has to be at least that level, which you never want it to be, because then it's more of the same from Bill Burr. Right. So you got <laughs> <laughs> which is which is worse than somebody saying you suck, you know, and everybody in the Internet's such cunts. Somebody's going to fucking no, like but I mean, anyways, you're working but, at a top level. It's like if you're batting 340 every year, it's 340 year after year, really that bad. But I got to say the last special, all your stuff is just unreal. But when you did the bit where you're playing catch. With oh, the, that one, yeah. Dude, are you kidding me? I mean, that's like, I could see a kid watching that. I'm sorry. That's that's like on the level of the greatest of greats. It was all like, right, even, all right. I'm sorry. I'm sitting there watching that. But the difference between where you're at, too, though, is you are the only one who decides, right? Like, for me, when I, I knew I wanted to do it with Showtime. I didn't want to go back to these places where they air it once and it's done. Yeah, you can't do that now. Right. So I got to the point where I sent it to them, and they go, we're not saying no, but we're not saying yes. But they were nice enough to work with me, right? So I tweaked some stuff because I had some stuff that was just current events. And I'm not a current event guy. So I, 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 I worked on another six months, sent it back in. And then the guys at Showtime said, all right, come to L.A. We want to see it once live and we'll make our decision, decision basically at the end of that night. So I'm like 10 uh, minutes in. The amount in. of people that they're just giving away half hours to, the fact that you've got to jump through all these extra hoops. Do they fly you out? Of course not. No, oh, of man. Of course not. <laughs> Nothing. I stayed at the Safari in Burbank. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, I got 10 minutes left, and the set's going great, you know? I mean, it's the ice house, too, where you oh, get yeah, that you free pass, too, you know? But you're like, 10 minutes left, you're like, nobody drop a glass. Come on, man. And it went great. And it went great, and finally I got it. And I really, you know, and, and looking back on it, I'm like, man, I'm glad these guys made me wait six months because it's better than it was six months ago. Definitely. And if I could decide when I could do my own specials, my next one would be coming out next Wednesday. Oh, really? Well, not really, but, you you know, you you sometimes you think something's great and then like a year later you're like i can't believe i thought that was great now it's great right see that's what that's my paranoia is like you want to do that perfect thing where you're sick of the fucking thing and you can't squeeze anything you can't bring anything up a little bit better you you taped it right at the perfect time but what's fucked up dude is we were just when you came in here for people listening here uh is i don't know it's just you get to a certain age in just years, even though you're counting with birthdays. They everything just feels like it was five years ago. And you were talking about we played this this touch football game. All these comics in uh, Central Park. Yeah, and we you, that was like twenty years ago. Twenty years ago. I was ago. like, nah, man. I thought it was like early two thousands. And I was thinking I was with Bobby Kelly, and we were trying to figure out why we were so sore. We were so sore the next day. I was like, yeah, dude, come on, man. We're thirty. And he goes, dude, don't fucking say that. I'm not thirty because he was like. I think he's like two, three years younger than me, but I was 29, going to be 30. So that means that it was sometime in 1997. It's almost 2016. Yeah, it was fucking 20 years ago. And I remember fucking Bobby 
getting so fu- I've told this story on uh, the old Opie and Anthony show. Bobby got so fucking mad um, during that game. Uh, I was blocking him or something, and like he just I I saw it. It's like his nostrils were flaring. He got all competitive, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he was he was gonna come in. I think I had a couple of catches, and he didn't have any yet. He's so funny. So he gets all competitive. So his fucking nostrils are flaring, and he comes flying at me, right? And like he just took the wrong step. I just sort of pushed him down to the ground. And it was just sort of effortless because he kind of fucked I up. I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. He started falling first. So I just sort of guided him to the ground. It was like when Don Zimmer ran at fucking Pedro. He just sort of guided him <laughs> yeah, down to yeah. the ground. He got so mad, he fucking grabbed two handfuls of grass, ripped him out of the ground, and then just both hands fucking threw him at, him, at me as hard as he could. And I was like four feet away from him. So for like two feet... The grass goes like 90 million out, miles an hour, and then it was grass. And then like a foot later, it just went like, <laughs> just dropped between the two of us. And I was looking at him like, what the fuck? And I remember that one of, the, one of those kids, you know, we didn't know everybody. It was some Puerto Rican kid there. And he just looks at Bobby and goes, yo, he bugging. <laughs> <laughs> and I just started laughing. It was one of the maddest, one of the maddest I ever saw him. But, uh, dude, we used to fucking God, play dude. rollerblade hockey. This is all 90s shit. And I remember we used to, like, every six games, me and him would almost get into a fist fight. We never quite got to that level. But, uh, but dude, that was way back in the day when we used to work. Uh, I remember the Boston Comedy Club. Yeah, man. What are you kidding me? Of course. I mean, that it's was crazy. like, I don't think, I don't, I always wondered if it was because we were new to doing stand up. Yeah, yeah. That, and we didn't know what we were doing, that that room was so like, just like, just the death that you could die in, in, in that fucking building, or if it really was as difficult. I mean, it was fucking insane. When dude. I first came down like 94, it was like people selling drugs right outside the front of it. You walked in, it was an absolute shithole. Barry Katz owned it, put like fucking three cents into the thing, had that old fucked up looking fireplace, fireplace yeah, of course, behind man. you on stage and like the piece of wood could come out. And I just remembered when you went in there, it was like, uh, I don't know, if it was any other room, I would have been like, you know what, fuck this. After I took a pound, it'd be like, right, fuck this place, right. this place is fucked up. But, but there was something about it because of the comics that were working oh, the there. guys that were working, they were insane. Yeah, man. you wanted to be able to have a good set in there. You were, oh, God, when you first broke in there, you were, like, nervous, and then, and then like, maybe a year or so when you find yourself putting your elbow on the mantle. That's when you know yeah. you're comfortable there. Dude, I got a, one of the most embarrassing things in my life on stage happened at that club. It was, it was one of those urban nights, okay? Oh, dude, one of the 12 embarrassing things in my life happened in that fucking club. Now, I was, I was only about, I don't know, maybe a year into comedy, right? And I just started becoming a little friendly with Brewer. So now I go down there one night, and I would just hang out, try to get on, that sort of thing. And Brewer and Chappelle meet up, and uh, they're going to go around the corner. This is, again, years and years ago, and they're going to smoke a joint, and they invite me to what come. What was this, like 92, 3, 4? Like 94, 5. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we go around the bend. And so just to put it in perspective, men in tights for... Uh, no, Nutty Professor, he was making, and Brewer was on Saturday Night Live. He was. Okay, yes. cool. All right. Because we go around the bend, and I'm like just being quiet, so excited to be hanging here, right? And we're smoking the joint, and... Uh, Chappelle's telling the famous story about his end from Eddie Murphy being mad at David Spade for that. You remember that famous story oh, yeah, yeah. where Spade said, look, a falling star in his picture, Eddie Murphy. Catch a falling star. Yeah. Spade just recently wrote a blog about it's like famous. Everybody yeah. knows that story. It's still going on. I think he finally saw Eddie and Eddie said, hey, what's up? So I think it's finally like fucking 20 years yeah, later. It's yeah. finally over. Yeah. And in that point, it was wild because I'm sitting there getting Chappelle's end of it because he's doing Nutty Professor with. Eddie Murphy when that happened. Right. And then Brewer's on with Spade on Saturday Night Live. So they're telling each other's version of the phone call and stuff. And I'm like, wow. So then we go back to the club. And again, packed urban night, as we said. It was a little cold. So I'd gotten there early and I put my coat down. So this cold. is Sunday night, the all black show. Yeah. People don't know what urban night is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's this not is not urban outfitter <laughs> night. <laughs> and this is important to know because I put my coat down <clears throat> and they're both high. And Jason, who runs the club at the time, goes, who wants to go first, Jim, you, Dave, you? And they go, no, no, let me relax. And they go, put Petey on, put Petey on, you know? And I'm freaking high. I'm not even good at comedy, really. So they put me on first, dying, right? I'm bombing. I'm three uh. minutes in. Brewer and Chappelle are dying laughing. Uh, I do about five minutes to the point where, you know, black people going, he's corny. Get him uh, off. He's corny. Uh, right? Brutal. So I, <laughs> I, I get off. And now all I want to do is go home, right? I can't find my fucking coat. I have no idea what my coat is. My keys to my apartment are in my coat. It's totally dark. I'm doing that where you're walking around and you uh, swear it's under somebody's seat. And you're like, can I just, can I just? And yeah. I just saw you bomb. Yeah. yeah. And now these women are going, what you want? What you want? And then. Um. 
there's a black host, and he goes, what's going on back there? What's going on back there? And someone yells out, white boy can't find his coat. The white boy can't find his coat. So he goes, turn the motherfucking lights on. Turn the motherfucking lights on. And they turn the lights on, and they're all looking around going, is this your coat? Is this your And I'm walking around trying to find, and finally some lady in the back, I remember I put it by that little bar in the back oh, area. Oh, God. She goes, is this your coat? And I go, yeah. And I go over and I get my coat, and they give me a big applause. And they go, you keep warm. Get out of here, white boy. Bye-bye. Oh, and I just took my coat, and they put the lights on, and I went home. <laughs> Oh, shit. You know something that we, what I hated? Nobody it pays love. dues like that anymore. They do five minutes of stand-up, and then they're on a goddamn special. Sorry, bro. I know. It saying? seems. It seems like that. <laughs> yeah. I was just saying that what I always loved and hated about black crowds was they're going to have fun either way. They're either having fun with you because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you're killing, or you're gonna, they're going to laugh at you. Either way, you kill. Oh, yeah. The, the, I, there'll be either you tell the joke and people laugh, or you tell the joke, there's a pause, somebody else says something, and then there's, like, the big laugh. Dude, I remember one time fucking oh, yeah. eating it in front of all black crowd, and uh, there was this comedy club called Mix Nuts, and now it's called uh, Comedy Union out here in California, so uh, out here in L.A., and I'm doing – I go up there, dude, and just from the from the, the get-go, I am just bombing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 30 seconds in, I got dry mouth, and I am just – and then I'm just plowing through my act – and nobody is saying anything. There's not a sound in the room. It's just the sound of my dry lips <laughs> as I'm fucking doing these jokes. And finally, two and a half excruciating minutes of dead silence. This big girl in the back just, just calm as shit, just looks at her friend and just goes, I ain't laughed yet. And the whole place just goes, what? And everybody, and then they just started laughing at me, and I didn't know how to address it, and I stayed in my act and just stayed in the bubble like I was doing my show at some other comedy club where people were listening, dude, and it was fucking... Oh, the, I'm getting embarrassed now. The, the fucking humiliation of that. <laughs> to stay in your act is the worst part oh, about no. it, too. It's like you're just trying to hide behind this bubble of words that don't exist, man, you know? No, you have to You you, you, you have to address it. Like It's weird. Like a, a white crowd will almost get uncomfortable with you. But either way, you have to break the, the tension. But um, getting back to the, the Boston Comedy Club, dude, I had such horrific sets there when I first started. You know, when you first came to town, like Steinberg and Frost would fucking test you and they put you on after Red Johnny and the Round oh, Guy. Oh, God, yeah. Who murdered. They were this comedy team. And I remember they would end their set doing uh, their version of that song, it, ta it Takes Two. It takes two to make a thing go right. Insane. Go, insane. Yeah. And they would be flicking the fucking lights on and off, on and off. And dude, you literally felt like, dude, I, have, I don't have a joke in my act. And they would just throw you. No, up that's there. the show's over after that. The show is over. Everybody go home after. The only right guy down. I ever saw, a new guy I ever saw, go down and fucking not only kill but fucking level after it was Dane Cook. Dane Cook, oh, I believe that. had the energy. Oh yeah, dude, he went up there, and that, that's the funny thing about all, all the fucking shit that was said about that guy. Like they don't understand like the level that that guy murdered. Uh, I'll never understand that, right? Dude, he went up there and just fucking like he he treated them like the, he was his, like they, they were like his opener. He just took it to an entirely different level. Yeah. And um, I remember Steinberg years later was talking about him. And Jason ran the room back then, and he said to me, he just said, "Yeah, man." He goes, "I couldn't bury the kid. I couldn't bury him." And, and I remember thinking, like, "Yeah, I knew you guys used to do that. You used to when guys came down. It was the exact opposite of any other club where they'd be like, oh, he's a new guy. Put him up early. Put him up after the fucking you know." okay act when you went to the boston comedy club they they threw you right into the fire and they right into the deep end yeah. and i think that that's why i wanted i kept going back there dude i used to, used to used to walk by that club and during the day if i saw it i got sick to my stomach just going <laughs> yeah. like oh god that fucking like it dude it literally had my heart sometimes i didn't even recognize it during the day i'd be halfway past it and go oh shit there it is just because it's such a night thing a dark night yeah. thing and but the thing about it, too, is, uh, you know, the idea that you had to go through there and do that. I, like, sometimes I'll be on the road now and, like, these features go, I'm deciding if I should move to L.A. or New York and da-da-da. And they're talking about comedy. And, like, the, the one question, like, you got to ask yourself is, do you love it? You got to love it so much yeah. that, like, you bl we were blind to that, man. It was no big deal. You walk home after getting beaten and batted there and... Yeah, and you know what's funny? You know what kills me is quitting. Never even like I never even thought about quitting. I would just immediately be thinking about after I was getting past, I would try to think of like uh, like how I could do better the next time. I just remember the worst part was just when you went to bed and just you just laying 
in your fucking bed. I had a, I had a walk through bedroom, railroad apartment back then. Remember that shit up on 97th Street? Yeah, right? yeah. And I would fucking just be laying there in the bed, just like with the humiliation of the set, just going through my fucking head and everything. And like, like it would take you all the way into like maybe two in the afternoon of the next day to finally get your feet for me, anyways, get my feet back underneath me, and then I have a spot at the strip. And it'd go okay. Oh, yeah, of like, course. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, thank God. I'm still funny. I, I'm still funny. But, like, I think that there was a lot of guys that went down to the Boston Comedy Club and got their heads handed to them. And then they went back up to those uptown clubs, uh, meaning, like, Stand Up New York and The Strip. Yeah, and they just yeah. stayed there. And I think that that hurt them as comedians because, I mean, who's kidding? Doing the Boston Comedy Club exclusively would also hurt you because then you become a hell room comic. Yeah. You needed that balance of both where you go to the comic strip, you're like, oh, this this feels like, this what must be what it's like when you make it. That's cardio. When you're working yeah. out, the comic strip's cardio. The, the yeah. Boston Comedy Club squats, yeah. dead weights. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, those different. The, what do they call those things? Kettlebells? Uh, yeah, all that nasty stuff, man. Exactly. That was the biggest difference. And you'd go uptown sometimes, and then you'd be like, oh, this is this is easy peasy. I mean, every, this is so easy. But then you'd start to look. Sometimes when I go uptown late to the strip, I'd sit in the back and I'd be like, I think it's the same white guy just changing outfits. Like, uh, no, they had that. They had that. Ba- they, I remember like Lucian Madonna back in the day. Or something. Yeah. Rest his soul. You, um, first time I came down to the comic strip and I, uh, Lucian Holt, legend in the uh, New York comedy scene and stand up in general. And I remember going there and just being like, hey, Lucian, I just want to introduce myself. My name's Bill Burr. I'm a comedian from Boston. And he just nods his head and he just went, I already have enough white guys. <laughs> and there were so many white guys that got offended by that, going, dude, that's so fucked up. If you said that about a black guy, blah, 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 like acting like it was the same thing. It's just like, dude, I know what this guy's saying. Yeah. Don't be another guy coming in here talking about the same shit. I, I just took that immediately. It's like, if you don't have a unique voice, I'm not going to yeah. put you on stage because I already have enough of you. Well, that's exactly it because I would go down anywhere, even to the comedy cell, for example, and I would have like my clever joke about something that happened in the news. And then I'd be like, well, I'm wasting my time because Geraldo and Attell are doing this shit way better than I ever could. Right. And they're way more invested in it. So I'm just going to talk about my life, you know. And then, and then I took one lesson where I was going to lose my accent. I had the damn uh, wine cork in my mouth and trying to, you know. You, I'm like, what, what the fuck am I doing? Just be who you are. It's all this shit that's separating you from every other white guy sometimes. Yeah. No, and then you, you go to the Montreal to Festival. I'm sorry, man. Every guy in Canada is like... I mean, uh, who's the one who does this? I love that he does that. It's the only, it's the most physical thing I've ever seen a comedian comic do. The, who's the one who ho- oh, holds oh, his nose? Oh, uh, oh my oh, God. I love he him, Fucking too. murders. Yeah, he's so funny, man. I, uh, Je- <laughs> is it Jeremy or something? Anyway. Oh, Jeremy Hutz. Yeah, J- yeah, he touches his nose. That's like the f- most physical thing dude, I've seen. Dude, that guy, when you got a guy's got to go see, dude, when that guy gets on a fucking roll, he almost uh-huh. kills people. Uh, yeah. When he keeps going, what a... Piece of shit that is. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, brings yeah. Up. Dude, once the crowd buys in, like, uh, I, 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 that, that's one of the hardest comics I've ever had to follow. Uh, him, Greer Barnes. Oh, forget it. Yeah. When I, even when I go back to the city now and I play, I always look ahead to see if Greer's on before me because that's the one we like, all right. Dude, the love a crowd has for Greer Barnes, if he's doing eight minutes, forget about if he's doing like a 15 minute spot. Like, I always felt like when I went on stage after him, I literally felt the disappointment. Like, they were like, oh, you know, another black comic. Another guy who's going to do all this cool beatbox and characters and all this crazy shit. And I was just going to come up there and be like, hey, you know, what's up with Bill Clinton? Like, no one gave a, no one gave a fuck. You literally felt like the, the uh, I, I, he was one of the few guys I ever just felt like just, just disappointment. It was, it was, and I always thought it was so genuine, too, where it's like, obviously, if you go on after like some, uh, you know, some soap star or some shit like that. That's a different thing. He was yeah. just like, that guy from day one, he's another guy, man. I can't figure out why that guy doesn't. Well, he's got that bit too, for example, where he's scuba diving and the, and he's under the water. And the, ah. and the majority of the bit is complete silence. He and doesn't say anything for like three minutes and he's making the noises of the bubbles and he's yeah. acting this shit out and is fucking murdering. Really? Now, I, I'm old school. I think you're a little like this too. When there's no laugh to go, I get all bugged out. I'm like, let's go. I, I mean, I'm, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. come with it. I come with it. And like when I saw you do, like I said, the one where you're having a catch, that made me, you know, again, it's Brewer does that too. Chappelle, take your time. Don't worry if there's no laughter. They're going to come in big at the end. But, you know, like, like Chappelle sometimes will have these two-minute bits where you're not supposed to be laughing. Yeah. 
Uh, and then the end is going to make you die laughing. But I, I'd be too worried in the two minutes. I'm like, oh, this better have you, a big ending. You know what's it. fucked up, though, is when I first started out, I took a comedy class. This guy, Vinny Favorito, who's now in uh, he works in Vegas. And uh, I never forget. He said something in that class. He was talking about people like, you know, talking about silence and people being afraid of it. And he was saying, you know what's weird? You just watch a comic up there and they're fucking blah, 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 going like 90 miles an hour and it's not going well. And he goes, and all of a sudden they go and they tell a street joke. And they just be like, all right, two guys walking to a bar, right? There's a horse over there. And he goes, immediately the crowd shuts the fuck up and they listen. He goes, they're going to listen if yeah. there's like a story. So like usually like a street joke, when somebody tells you a street joke, you're going to sit there for 45 seconds waiting for the punchline. Yeah, true. But, but you do. If the guy tells the story... The right way it's going to happen. So I remember, um, for whatever reason, <clears throat> that stayed with me. But it took me, I think, like 19 years to be able to apply that. Yeah. To be able to go into areas where I just think New York and Boston comedy scenes are similar, where it was like you get on stage. Once you get your foot on their neck, you don't take it off for the rest of the set and you like just beat the shit out of them every fucking eight seconds. Like that was what you were trying to do. And there was. Right. Even when I was in Boston, I would say like Tony V and Kenny Rogerson were the only guys that I, that I saw that had more of like a relaxed style and could still murder. And then you can come up there and come back and do right. I, I it had, gives you dynamics. It does. It do, and like, but when you saying how it took you a long time to really apply it, like on my first special, I have a bit long story short where at the end of it, I say something about uh, uh, being a cobra in a basket. You know, when someone plays the flute, so I pretend I'm a cobra in the basket. Right. And the bit is the flute's playing, and I get excited, and eventually I pop out. And uh, the thing about it is, I love it, and it's funny. But if I'm not doing it just right, I'm scrouched down, and when I'm scrouched down, I can tell before you know. I pop up. Yeah. Oh, they're not gonna laugh. I'm gonna be popping up like an asshole, a complete silence. I literally pop up and go into that. As I'm popping up, I go. I flew the other day on Southwest. Like I'm already into the next bit yeah. before I'm done doing the fucking snake. <laughs> do, do you remember? Do you remember uh, doing Danger Fields? <laughs> Dude, I was at Dangerfields the last time Rodney went on stage. I was on the show he was on. It was incredible, man. Are you serious? I came in. It was a Saturday night. I mean, he was he died like about a month after that. And uh, Tony, who right. runs this, the place, it was packed because it's Bridge and Tunnel Saturday night. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Britt is uh, emceeing. And he goes, Mike to, Britt's a beast. Beast. So yeah. funny. So funny. And uh, Tony goes, listen, Rodney's in the crowd. A lot of people don't know it. He's sitting with his wife right up front in his robe, uh, and he's going to come on after you, Pete. And, uh, you know, he, he liked the guy. I'm, he didn't even really. He was very old, you know, so right. it wasn't going to be much of anything. So uh, I'm going to do 15 minutes in front of Rodney. The guy's, like, going to die any day. I try to do every joke I ever written in 15 minutes. Like, he might uh, pop up, shake my hand, and go, let me make a few phone calls for you. <laughs> the guy didn't even know he was indoors, Billy. And I'm rattling off all my, right? So I get off. I stand off to the side. And uh, Mike Britt introduces Rodney. Place goes crazy, okay? Rodney gets up. He's walking so slow. It's, it's like from here to the wall. And it takes him, like, 20 minutes, that 15. Five solid minutes with his wife helping him. The people even stopped clapping, so I started clapping so they'd keep the clap. I mean, keep the clap going. Right, he, right. He grabs the mic in a perfect Rodney voice. If you close your eyes, he's not, he, he grabs the mic and about Mike Brady goes, How about another round of applause for the Moon Yan, huh? <laughs> 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 Mike Britt starts cracking up to it, and he puts his arm around Mike Britt. He does about a minute and a half, some joke. It was very funny and worked, and then he and then he shuffled off, and then he passed away in about a month. Wow. Yeah, and I didn't meet him or shake his hand or anything because he was back in the crowd, and I had to get back down to the cellar. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> the thing about Dangerfields, now, when we came to New York, that club was like, it was in a bad place where it was just like <clears throat> they had comics that had been working there since the fucking place had opened and if they and it just I went in there one night dude and, and that was one of those nights where I felt like quitting comedy. I watched this I'm not gonna say this comic's name, but I saw this guy on stage and it was the most bleakest, darkest, like the negativity that was hanging in the fucking air. And then what happened was Jim Norton. Yes. You just said his name. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my God, dude. <coughs> like I, I watched three minutes of that guy's set. And if I had, if there was a gun in the room, I would have had it in my mouth. I would have shot him first 
just out of just humanity. <laughs> yeah. How fucking bleak this guy was. So yeah, that's the kind of guy you want to play in a movie to win your Oscar, an independent film playing oh. actor. What are you going home to? What are you doing when you get home, man? Right. And he was sitting in there and like, dude, I'm, I'm not lying. I love Dangerfield. But the reverb on that mic was fucked up for like seven years straight. Nobody adjusted it. Oh. And, you know, what was the worst is if you did like a high energy bit and there was nobody in there, that fucking echo. You know, which sounds great on like a Dean Martin album, like fills yeah, out his voice. Yeah, but yeah. if you're fucking doing like singing, I mean, I'm doing jokes, <laughs> at, you're eating your balls. But Norton was the guy that first started doing it. Yes. You and guys got to go there. You get to do a half, half hour. You yeah. get $25. Norton single handedly, I think, saved that place because he got us yeah. all to go there. I remember everybody was giving him shit. I remember Patrice, rest his soul, goes, uh, he goes, where are you coming from, Norton? He goes, Dangerfield. And he goes, yeah. And he goes, oh, yeah. He goes, who, he goes, who'd you go on after, Ruth Buzzy? <laughs> and, and, every, and everybody's dying laughing. And Norton defended it, though. He was going, dude, you got to go up there. So I was living on the Upper East Side like you, and you and I started doing it. Yeah. And then I remember Sherrod came in. And then there was this great thing. It just all of a sudden just fucking turned around. Yeah, All of those, those older guys took off and left. And uh, But what was weird was, that, you know, and as cool as the decor remained the exact same. Like, if you're into, like, shit from back in the day, you got to go to Dangerfields. I mean, oh, it, it literally looks like you think you feel like Johnny Carson is going to come walking in when he still had, like, jet black hair or brown hair and shit. Like, when when you're sitting there with those those little fucking those little lampshades. And stuff. <laughs> yeah, and everybody writes their initials on the lampshades. And uh, it's literally like a lounge in Vegas from 1970. They only have male waiters, and the waiters all still wear the red jackets. Career waiters, too. Yeah. And it's it's just, a, you know, I mean, the photos on the wall when you first come in, because, like, Billy Joel did a song for Easy Easy Money for Rodney's movie, so there's a photo of Billy Joel was there, and, you know, Sinatra and all these great Elvis. people there. But Elvis then the, with Rodney. But then the thing would happen after a while, Bill, is I would play there, and uh, then I'd be back at the cellar, and, you know, sometimes in between spots, everyone sits around, chats, and I'm, I'm running out, and one's like, where are you going? My like, guy, oh, I got a danger field. And he's like, well, you still going to danger field? <laughs> like, it, it, it stopped. And I, because it got to the point where it was 75 bucks, I live around the corner, and I'd be like, how can I not bop in? And just get a quick 75. Tell I, a few. But the thing about me is I fucking love that place. Sometimes. Other times it would just Not literally. Completely. It's the only place I had a breakdown where I was like, you know, the only time where I was ever looking at the crowd like, what, what, did you just come here for fucking heat? Why are you even here? Dude, I saw some, I've seen some of the, I, one of the fucking most bizarre heckles I ever got and one of the best heckles I ever saw, I saw in that room. All right, the one that happened to me, right? I'm yeah. fucking standing on stage, and there's just this group. I, I told this one time, I think on a special, or it was an extra or something. It was like four white dudes in the corner, dude. And you could feel the fucking anger coming off these guys. You could feel the fucking awful dads that beat them with belt buckles and shit. I, like, I've never felt an energy like that in my yeah. life. <clears throat> so I go on stage, and they're so fucking angry, and they're a little loud being drunk that they're intimidating the entire crowd. So I'm standing on stage bombing, and I know I'm bombing. <laughs> Because those fucking guys, their energy and everything in me is saying, don't say anything, don't say anything, just fucking get through the shit. And then finally, I was just bombing so bad I had to say something. I was just saying like, hey, what are you guys talking about over there? They're like, what? I said, yeah, what, what are you guys talking about over there? And the guy yells out. He goes, anything red and on stage is a faggot. <laughs> That's what he said. Which I don't even know what the fuck that means. Like. It was just so fucking like childish and Stupid, I just, but, but dude, it was hilarious. And I'm sitting there going like, I went right back into my act and I'm sitting there. Part of me is la I'm furious. The other part of me is laughing my ass off because I can't wait to go down the cellar exactly. and, like, and tell the story. Dude, that's like saying anybody who's sitting over there has girl germs or cooties, like something in the second grade, but it was still fucking hilarious. And I just, just eating my balls and they did nothing about it. Oh, forget whatsoever. No, they never will. And I just sat there eating my balls and got off stage, and I had to walk by the fucking table. It just, I don't know. The, the, they had that one, and then there was the guy. Uh, but it makes you better, man. Somehow uh, those make you better, man. It makes you. I, don't, I didn't mind that in a hell room, but there was always that thing where, like, when if they if you're actually in a comedy club and they're not policing it at all, you're just like, so all you give a fuck is that these people are eating and drinking. Yeah. And, and if they yell at me or throw shit at me, you don't give a fuck as long as they pay their check in the end. But um, the other time. Uh, I don't know how to do this joke because I don't want to say the guy's name because I I'm feel, saying a name I, I, and I tell a Dangerfield's joke or story. But go ahead. All man. right. So this actor slash comedian goes on stage. All right. 
All right, people can figure out this. I'm not going to say his name out of, out of respect. So he fuck, and he's one of the funniest comics I know. I'm going to say it, Frank Santarelli. He's okay. one of the funniest guys ever. Oh, so, with the cigarette. He does a cigarette. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Fucking hilarious. hilarious one of yeah. my favorites of all time. So he's on stage, and uh, it's just this fucking, one of those summertime crowds where they're just fucking sitting there. And one of those things, like, why the fuck did you people come out here? Exactly. So they're sitting there, and he goes up on stage, and he's on The Sopranos. You know, he plays the bartender and mm-hmm, everything. Mm-hmm. So he goes on stage, and they're just not having it. They're not listening. They're not laughing. And his shit is really, it's like Greer Barnes where like he'll go into a bit and it's like this 10 minute high level concept thing and they're not buying it. So finally, you know, he's like 10 years older than me. So he's trying to reach out to this crowd because it's a young crowd. He goes, hey, man, he goes, uh, uh, you, you guys like the Sopranos? Hey, you guys like the Sopranos? He goes, I play so-and-so. I, I, I play the bartender. Every week, uh, Tony Soprano beats the shit out of me. And this guy in the back without missing a beat goes, he should have killed you. <laughs> Hank, I don't even know to this day if Frank ever heard it. I was like, oh, my God, that's fucking hilarious. So, and I wanted to laugh my balls off, but I had to go on next. So I'm literally watching the beatdown that I'm going to take, right? It was like when your mother would line you all up and, you know, to beat you or whatever, and you're, like, waiting. Like, yeah. okay, that's just, this is gonna, maybe she'll get tired by the time she gets to me, right? Maybe she'll get a phone call or something. Yeah, so he walked off stage. I remember he walked by me. It's still classic Frank, funny as hell, didn't say anything. He just walks by me, just doesn't look at me, just goes, wow. <laughs> wow. He said it twice. Wow. And just fucking... <laughs> That's all you can do at that place sometimes. I mean, Carrie Caravis used to be on stage there at night. We're doing prom shows. I used to do prom oh, shows yeah. there. Oh, no. I just, I mean, that's literally just go. If you can just go up there and, and stay up there for 10 minutes, you get your 50 bucks or whatever it was. It was it was not about comedy. It wasn't about anything. Oh, you'd have a better chance going to Port Authority and just with a Mr. Absolutely. Microphone. You'd get more laughs. She would yell from the stage because I'd be last. She'd be second to last. She'd yell from the stage. Corey Alley, I got five, four minutes, five more minutes. How fucking jealous are you? Oh, and the crowd's hilarious. not even <laughs> mad that she's bragging that she doesn't have to be in front of them in yeah. five more minutes. Completely didn't get it. And the, cl- and the club would latch on to the weirdest characters to be their, like, comic, like the, the comic of the, you know how, like, you know, certain com- comics, like, Attell's known for the comedy seller, right? right. You know? The 12 o'clock spot. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I remember Dangerfields went through a phase where Steve Marshall was hosting all the shows, and he was their guy. He's not there to behave. Oh, yeah. I'm not, I'm not here to behave. That's right. his whole slogan. So he would do, dude, it's so weird. He would do his last bit every show. He'd have a dozen roses, and he would slam each rose against the piano as he had a comment about women, like, and then you blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then at the end, you know, the show would end. And then when everyone left, he'd have to go back in and pick up his roses. Like the club wouldn't even do it for him. <laughs> and then, and then like, I remember in between shows sometimes, cause it was a Korean deli where he'd get the roses, you know, right. they're like, Steve, you're next. So-and-so's running late. And he'd go, I don't even have my roses yet. I didn't even go get my, and they go, well, hurry up and go get your roses. <laughs> so he'd have to run to the Korean deli and get his fucking roses. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention that's half your paycheck and, and flowers, man, right? Yeah, dude. And Where all... are you going with that, dude? That's what it doesn't have any. Guilty as charged, dude. I remember I used to work in a dental office. <laughs> I worked in a dental office with my dad when I started out, and we used to have like when we were really drilling into somebody's tooth, dude, it was gross, man. Shit would be flying out of the mouth. So you basically had this plastic, it looked like a welder's mask, but it was all plastic. Yeah. So all the spittle that would have hit your face is hitting the dental. Oh, sure. It was a fucking disgusting job. So um, I got the idea one night that I was going to put it on because I was so young. I was going to put it on on stage or whatever, and I was going to – this was going to be my closing bit. <laughs> so for like like maybe two and a half months of my stand-up career, I had this little duffel bag, and I would be bringing this stupid mask on stage. And the funniest thing was I didn't even have a joke. I would just put it on. And I would just say, like, you know, my job during the day, you know, you know what it's like working there? The job stinks so bad, I gotta wear this. And I would put it on, and they'd sort of chuckle, and they were like, and? And where does this go? And I would just have the thing on. And with the screen in front of me, like, muffling my voice, I'd be like, yeah. thanks a lot, you guys have been <laughs> As I'm taking it off. And finally, one day, I figured it out. I was, I, I was talking to this comic, uh, Todd Parker. Yeah. And, uh, God, we come a long way. Holy yeah. shit, dude. And I, and I said to him, oh, yeah, I actually thought that that was funny. So yeah. I, I talked to him. I said, you know, I'm not going to do that mask thing anymore. <laughs> and just, and he was, I remember he was sitting at the Kowloon with his arms crossed, looking forward, not looking at me. I go, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that mask thing anymore. And I was just like, and he just goes, oh, yeah. He's just looking at the stage. I go, yeah, I just feel like I'm just saying, like, I'm so not funny. I literally need to bring shit on stage to make myself funny. And he just sort of looked at me. He goes, yeah. 
Yeah, he figured that out. And I remember my heart sinking, going like, oh, my God, every comic was thinking that. And I didn't even know the whole, he's a prop yeah. comic and all that shit that, you know, those guys go through. Which I don't give a fuck if you use props. It's just funny. I don't give a fuck. Yeah, no, that's a different thing. But, I mean, if you're a prop guy, you're a prop guy. If you just got roses, I mean, that's it. It's like. You got, I mean, you got to go all in. You yeah, have, that's what I'm either saying. Got, either got a bunch of props. That's it. Or absolutely nothing. I mean, Vinny Favorino would have shut down the mask if you hadn't. Yeah. No, he would have. He, <laughs> <laughs> he definitely would have. Hey, I got the, actually, I finally got the website. For Pete's special, streaming on Showtime, go to sho.com and click on comedy, and it's going to be on there. But, uh, oh, yeah, Debbie, I could sit there and, and literally tell, uh, we haven't even got to the New York Comedy Club. Oh my! We're literally gonna, I'm locked and swept day, you know. We're, we're going to discourage people from, from becoming stand-ups because this is just going to because the hell gigs are the funniest ones. Well, this is all though before the social media was what it was. Where like now, instead of like I'm mopped and swept for stage time at the at New York Comedy Club. Now, right. if you, you know, you get yourself a nice little five minutes. You get it on the right website or something. I mean, you get it out there and on the internet, and, and then you can start to feature. That's the other thing too. With features now, it's like. I mean, I, you probably bring your own guys, but when I'm on the road and these features are on the road, it's like this. It's like the MC's really into comedy. The features like had it, and his last bit's always his T-shirt sale, and right. and then he's like, "Do you mind if I sell?" And if I say, "Well, I'd rather you didn't stand next to me and sell," it's not a flea market, you know what I mean? Then right. he won't talk to me the whole weekend. That's what happened the last time. The guy won't talk to me. <laughs> Uh, and, he, and, there's, and he's like, you know, they don't pay me enough to feature. And it's like, I nobody gave a shit about me when yeah, they I never featured. paid enough money to feature. That's not the end. You keep when your I was, day job. Yeah, when I, I, I was don't featuring, know what to tell you. Exactly. When I featured, I had a day job. I mean, Brew would tell me how Phil Tag. Remember Phil Tag? That yeah. Comment? Yeah, he had a, a he traveled with a coffee machine what, what, in his car and a waffle. Brew told me about one time. He's like, I worked with Phil. But it's like Brew lived out of his car when he started. Uh, I worked front desk at a hotel forever. I remember I worked. Front I don't want to be the guy who's all bitter on the new guys because there's a bunch of guys. There's a lot of great guys, right. but but it's just a different thing as far. It as is. I, rem I remember. You don't have to do a lot of that anymore. I remember it, fine. being in, working in Baltimore and I was working with uh, a feature act, and he was upset that he didn't get a half hour special. And I just remember thinking, like, dude, when I when I I started just this was like ten, twelve years ago. So yeah. I was only like ten years in. I'm thinking, dude, when I started. Like the half hour specials they gave to like seasoned headliners and they picked from an hour of, you know, I'm not saying there wasn't some weak specials, but yeah. like you had to be a headliner yeah, and yeah. you had to pick from an hour of shit. It's like you're a feature actor. It's like, are you going to go do your whole fucking act? You can do everything you ever. It's like they're almost doing you a favor. And like, they don't like, see like, that like, way. Like, but yeah. Thank God. Thank God, dude. If I did any specials. My shit in the fucking nineties, ugh. <laughs> yeah, dude, uh, I got the VHS tapes. I remember I found them one time and I was watching them with my wife. Dude, yeah. I sat there, I had my hand over my mouth. I couldn't fuck. Oh, I knew I was God. bad, dude. I couldn't believe how fucking bad I was. How fast I was going, dude. Forget about the clothes and the big fucking red afro. Forget about all of that shit, dude. I was fucking horrible, and uh, that's the one thing that too. that amazes me is these kids. Like they they get. They, they, from day one, they're putting their shit up on the internet. But they're better. Like, they all, a lot of them are better than I was that quick. I'll give them that. Like, you know, some of these guys young, uh, they're funnier than I was. They figured out how to write jokes better than I did that young. Dude, the crowd, no. The, the crowd at this point, they're making videos of each other, and then they post them. And they can, by comments, they, they learn what plays and what doesn't. Like, I really think it's, it's helped stand up because I think crowds in general are so much more educated to uh to stand up comedy that it, it kind of pushes you to, to you got to stay above you got to keep your head above the water line yeah yeah or, or you're gonna go under but the, there's obviously a bunch of great comics out there but like i i think is i'm much, following you are, are we are we you're like i don't want to say stuff about the young comics so i'm like all right we're gonna say good stuff about them now and then now well, you say whatever you, say whatever you want to say i don't think they pay their dues all right i said it man <laughs> i mopped and swept at the new york comedy club to get stage time i mean shit the stuff we went through to get on uh, oh, wait, that was the one I wanted to tell you. But here's the thing, though. The same technology that affords them to not have to have a day job is also what, you know, guys like us now decide when we're going to do a special. So it's helping everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do know what you mean. You're almost like, uh, not even like an asshole way, like, well, I had to do this, so you should have to do this. I think it helps you. No, no, that's it. It just makes you better. I mean, you, you know, I see guys now sometimes that become uh, famous early. 
And then you can see them like, uh, when you're on a show with them or something. They're biting their fingernails, man. They're a little worried because they don't have like – like I'll give you an example. One time I opened for an old friend. You must know Billy Gardell, right? Oh, yeah. From Mike and Molly. He's so funny, man. And I've done tours with him. He's just such a – he's really funny comedian. And uh, it's in – we're playing in Niagara Falls at the Falls View Casino. I was getting more money than I've kind of ever got. Uh, to open for him. I can't imagine what he was getting. Right. And it's all these uh, high rollers in the crowd and stuff. And he goes up and he's doing, I, I said to my wife was there, I go, this is going to be so funny because like when you pay this much money to see somebody, you almost don't expect them to be good. Yeah. Because like, they don't know anything <laughs> about him. You're almost paying just to see the guy. Right. And uh, for the first five minutes, you could see the look in their eyes like, whoa, wait, wait, he's got jokes. I mean, I thought he was just going to come up here and talk about, uh, yeah. you, know, you know, and it's like, being on the show. And that's from years and years of doing clubs and, and paying dues to get to that point, man. I think you just, you, you got, you know, you could see the relaxation in him. It's not like, oh, no yeah, worry no, at all. Billy's we're like, yeah, he, yeah, we're going to have fun. Yeah, he's an effortless storyteller. He's just one of those guys who'd be like, yeah, I was in Chicago two weeks ago, and you're in. You're yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. What yeah. happened? What yeah. happened? Well, so, dude, when I used to work front desk, I got to tell you, this is funny. I worked front desk. I'm oh, sorry, you got to roll? No, 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 no. It's hilarious. I mean, there's no way to look at the clock without the guests thinking that. I'm just going to make sure I don't go over. Oh, all right. What's, we, uh, got, we, we got another guy coming in here at like 12 oh, or whatever. All right. Oh, yeah, I got another guy coming in looking at the car. So, hey, you know, I'm doing, all, I'm doing the old salesman thing. I got I, another guy coming in here at 12. So Sebastian was telling me that you're flying helicopters? Yeah. I don't want to hear it, dude. I don't want to hear it. If you're going to shit it. Like, well, one thing I learned. This I'm not going to shit on that. Okay. I'm just going to say, isn't all that right. like the hardest thing to fly, right? Uh, no, this is shit way harder than that. But I mean, it's more difficult than, I guess, fixed wing. I've never tortured. It's just a regular Cessna thing, but it's, it's, it's no, it's, uh, the hardest shit is the ground school. All the shit that comics hate having ADD, learning all the, all, just all of that shit, looking at charts, the airspace, weather, all of that stuff. Um, it's the biggest accomplishment of my, more so than even becoming a comedian, just as far as how I'm wired, how difficult I thought it was going to be. I just just kept going there and it was fun and um but i've learned with anything whenever you do something like move to la or f fly in helicopters like there's just like a certain or, or just put your shit out on the internet there's always that new level of tough skin you're gonna have to get yeah like you go to la <clears throat> everybody's like oh my god they're so plastic everybody's so phony you lose your edge the comics stink and you're gonna have botox in your face and you gotta like block all of that out right and then, like, with aviation, I've learned, is just if the person you talk to also doesn't fly, they're just going to tell you you're going to die. Oh, so right. you immediately just got to, like, go, you just got to block <laughs> it out. Like, yeah. I flew yesterday, dude, the first time I flew in, like, a little over a month. And I, I can't even tell you how much fucking fun it was. I flew from Long Beach. I went up the 710 North. And I, I went straight up. It goes right to Pasadena. And right to the left, you see the Rose Bowl. I'll show yeah. you a video. I did a loop around the Rose Bowl. Now, are you are you solo at this point? Or no, you... I'm doing it solo uh, tomorrow. Like I just like I'm I'm really cautious because like I was going like all right, let me do this flight once with the instructor. I go and then I'll come back uh, Thursday. I'll do it once with you and then I'll do it. And by the time I was coming flying back, yeah, I was like, dude, I can do this one by myself. And he goes, oh yeah, he goes, you're totally ready. You got your head on a swivel. You're doing the radio calls. Yeah. You got the whole. You got it down. So, uh, Jeez, but why copter over plane? Why not plane? I mean, copter's uh, so like. So yeah, it's cooler. Man. yeah, it's it is. Cooler. I mean, I drive a Jeep Come Wrangler. On, you, bro. You, you, I drive you a Jeep Wrangler. I'm right there. That's yeah. like a copter. Yeah, yeah. You didn't fucking uh, <laughs> grow up watching uh, Magnum PI. You, you didn't want to be me? Magnum I PI. The... I wanted to be the guy in the helicopter. <laughs> that was awesome. TC, man. TC, yeah. man. What, are you kidding me? Yeah, no. TC, Rick, and uh, Magnum, dude. Um, I love that you think a Jeep is cool. That's so our generation. Like, I don't know if kids oh, think. They, I, I fucking yeah. It's just... I have such a great Boston story. It reminds me of you and Robert sometimes with the accent. My brother. Brother lived in Boston for a little while, and my wife and I, Jackie, were visiting him. And I had uh, my Jeep Wrangler, and it has New York plates, and it even says Manhattan on it because it was a Manhattan dealership. Had we won the World Series yet? Uh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. that's, that's not too bad. No, it's not too long ago. And I'm at a red light, and uh, nobody's banging a right like to, to turn right. And, and I'm just saying to my wife, in summertime, I get the top down. I'm like, typical fucking Boston. I mean, just bang the right. What are you doing here? Right, right. And right next to me is a parking lot. So I'm like, hey, screw these people. I'm just going to, in my head, I'm like, I'm just going to cut through the parking lot. So I just turned the wheel, and I'm going to cut through the parking lot. Now, what I didn't see 
is there was a curb right next to me. So I floor it and I turn the wheel and the Jeep hits the curb and like the dog almost flies out of the Jeep. My wife's oh, head God. bangs, everything. And I'm like, holy shit, you know, and we're just trying to regroup. And in perfect Boston accent right behind me, you hear some guy yell out, yeah, you go, New York, you hero, you. You go. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife's like, oh, my God, how fucking embarrassed are you right now? Yeah. That's I'm a, and then he just keeps yelling, I'm a hero. I don't wait for the light. Oh, God. Yeah. I don't know. You got to you know, love it. Hey, I got to ask you, as yeah. far as... Uh, as far as uh, your your sports affiliation is, I remember you're one of those weird Jets Yankees guys. Yes, because it's always Jets Mets Yankees Giants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, that's it. Yeah, I took a year off with the Yankees. Hat. I'm in mourning for Jeter. I just took a whole season. Off. Uh, Red just, Sox fan, dude, unhateable. One of the one of the few unhateable people. It's like Steph Curry, unhateable. Yeah. yeah. Can't hate him. It's like Big Poppy, man. It's even like Tom Brady. I mean, I'm a Jet fan, but it's like I was saying last year, we were doing a show and I was, someone was talking about uh, Russell Wilson's this and that. I go, listen, Russell Wilson's great for Seattle. Tom Brady is great for America. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we lost, obviously. I, I was actually, my last podcast I did, I was watching the game live and people were loving it and like hearing me flipping out and everything. But I got to be honest with you, dude, after watching... That year we went eighteen and one. Yeah, like, dude, an undefeated record in this day and age. It's not like when the fucking Dolphins did it. No, it's you know not. what I mean. When no. you had like white cornerbacks and shit, and yeah. there was the you know sports was five minutes after yeah. the end of the dude. It's I always say fucking... I could drop thirty on Bob Cousy if he was yeah. playing today. All right, it's a different <laughs> time. But continue. I, I'm not going that far. I'm talking just more about the me. That's hilarious, dude. That's fucking hilarious. But they like. An undefeated record is a fucking albatross around your goddamn neck. People get, people already get amped up if you're defending Super Bowl champions or yeah. if you had a nice run. They want to fucking beat you. Then they just want to be the guy that knocks you off. And I remember that year we went 18-1. and one. Like, dude, what we we fucked up was because, you know, Ray Mangini uh, uh, dropped dime on us that we were filming fucking the signs and shit. Yeah. And then everybody questioned all of our titles. So then they went into this rape and pillage mode for about three weeks and they were like, oh, yeah, this is what we could have been doing to you. And they would, that's when they started doing that shit, like, you know, going for two and running up in the score. And they were embarrassing people. It was the dumbest thing we could ever do. By October, everyone was like, oh, you're not fucking embarrassing us. And, dude, we played like a playoff level atmosphere. I swear to God, somewhere yeah. around the Cowboy game or the Colt game in mid-October for the rest of the – I remember the Ravens that year or somebody sucked – and we played a Monday night football, and the place was packed, and people were like with the towel, like the terrible towel thing going over their head for a fucking like a game in November. Yeah. yeah and, well. they, and they were completely out of the play. Maybe it wasn't the Ravens, but they were completely out of the playoff picture. So I'm actually, um, I don't give a fuck about the undefeated thing. You want the championship, but. Of course. But man. what I'm nervous about is like we, we, the only star we got left is Brady. Everybody's. Everybody's out. Yeah, but uh, come on, let's be honest. I mean, you guys, uh, my next door neighbor, your next door neighbor could be running cross patterns for Brady next week for all we know. I mean, did, uh, did anyone know Edelman? Uh, uh, these little white guys just drive. Yeah. I don't even know any of these guys except for the Gronk. I, I felt the same way about Magic Johnson. Like, if I ever played on the Lakers yeah. at my age right now, 47 year old, slow fucking white dude, if I played with magic on the showtime laker at the end of the game somehow i would have like three points Absolutely. And, I, and i should have had like 12 yeah oh yeah like oh that? he'll set you up for layups all right so how did it happen i don't yeah. know he was yeah. looking the other way everybody went there and then i had it and i you'll I have mean, three points yeah. and five other times you'll be going back down going my bed my, my bed, bed magic <laughs> yeah like there's there's a few guys out there that are like that so i gotta ask as a jets fan um yeah. How, how did you feel about the move with Rex Ryan uh, getting rid of him? Did you feel like he ran the course or whatever? Because I think that guy's a really, he's a really good coach. He just, I feel like his big thing is he hasn't had a quarterback. Like, yeah, and, oh, I, and Sanchez was not as good as people said he was, but he's not as bad as they say. Like, I think, you know, I think he should be starting over Bradford. Well, I don't know, man. I mean, he's he's got no. It's soft. His throws are soft. He has, there's no cannon. There's no, I mean, now we got Fitzpatrick, who's too short. I've never seen a guy's balls get knocked down so many times. It drives right. me nuts. But you're right. I mean, but why can't Rex Ryan just come out and say that? Is that so bad to say? It's like, give me a quarterback yeah, and I'll quarterback. win, man. I've never had, even now. Tyra. Dude, he came into New England. Beat You guys beat us in the playoffs in New England. After we fucking killed you in December when it didn't yeah. fucking count, you guys came back. Um, so that's the thing about him. If we meet the Bills again in the playoffs, like that's in the back of my head. I'm thinking, like, all right, who do they got out there in Buffalo for quarterback? Uh, Tyrod Taylor. Yeah, yeah. I'm I live thinking, right outside there. 
Yeah, you like what, Rochester? No, I live oh, uh, right, 40, in a small town called Fredonia, but 45 minutes away from Buffalo. Dude, I live where I went to college. I live down the block from my college. Now, how do you, how do you like it out there? Ah, it's a small town, college a town. I love it, but I mean, so I know you got to go, but I got to tell you real. No, no, no. I I played basketball Division three there, right? Right. And by my junior year, I was named captain, and I quit. And I remember the coach bringing me in. He's like, "You're making a big mistake." But all the guys I'd played with already were gone. Now as young kids, and they didn't like to drink and party on the road, which I did. So I was like, "I'm done with these guys." Wait a minute, you were going to be captain of the team? I was captain, and you quit because your teammates wouldn't drink and smoke with you. Well, I didn't smoke, but yeah, because... That's fucking awesome. Yeah, but they wouldn't... That's like, like old school. But I'm like, we're Division Three. We're not on scholarship. That dream is gone. We're going to Rochester for a weekend tournament. You're not going to go out to the bar and meet Rochester girls? What are you... <laughs> it's over, guy. What, are you going to play in uh, Turkey someday? It's done. Mm. Division Three. Our center was 6'4". Get the memo. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so... So my coach told me I regret it, you know, and I was like, no, I'm quitting. And I do, I, I dude, I would literally have dreams as, uh, years later that I was a senior dropping 40 points. It was dumb. I, should, I was in such a rush to party, and I didn't right. realize the party's never over, especially when you graduate and you move to the city. So cut to 20, to, what, two years later, by chain of events, my wife's from this area. I have a daughter now. She doesn't mm -hmm. want to be in the city. We move back. To, and it's the nicest town around, so we moved back. And then yeah. living in a big old Victorian home right around the corner from my college. It's Christmas morning, and I'm shoveling my driveway at 7 a.m., and a car pulls up at the end of the driveway, and I hear a voice go, Pete Corielli, and the window comes down, and it's my coach. And I'm like, Coach, and he goes, I heard you moved to town. We're going to get coffee soon. And then he looks out, and he goes, Merry Christmas. And I, I run into Jackie and I go, Jackie, it was the coach. We're going to get coffee. And I'm like, closure, Billy. <laughs> oh, because he, he never really forgave you for that? No, he never forgave me. He's now the, just the school's of, uh, AD or whatever, you know. And he's like, oh, we want you to come do a show for the, for the kids. And uh, will you talk to the team? I go, I'll talk to the team about not quitting. Because everyone quits. They right. wanted to get a scholarship. They didn't get a scholarship. So then they go, screw this, and they quit. And I'm going to tell them. But it was just funny, man, you know. But I'm on the road a lot, so it's not like, you know, that's what kind of... No, no, no. It, it, look, believe me, dude. I if, explain if, to you. If, if I was in a, uh, if I was in a, you know, if I wasn't in this business, I wouldn't live out here. But I, I actually do love it out here. I and, do, too. I liked it. I was here for a year. My wife and I liked it. I was getting into boogie boarding in Manhattan Beach. I was oh, really, yeah. I was if you it, embrace man. it. Exactly. The thing about it is, you know, we're so East Coast that you know eventually you're going back. Like, I don't know. Maybe yeah. I will. Maybe I won't. But it's just like, so. You ain't going Like, back. what? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It depends with this drought, dude. We might all have to go back. <laughs> <laughs> but they, uh, the first time I lived in L.A. in the late 90s, I was like, uh, I hated it because I wanted to be in New York. And then the next time I came back out in like 2007 or 8 when I came out here, I was like, you know what? I'm going to embrace it this time. I'm going to fucking hike and I'm going to yeah. fucking go out to the beach. And, well, I'm, I'm not going to the beach. I'm too fucking pasty. But like, you know, I got into the helicopter thing out here. Yeah. I played pickup hockey. I've had, I've, I actually took the time to build a fucking life out here. Sure. Because the first time I was, you know, sitting in, you know, one bedroom apartment, sparsely furnished. I just was not. Yeah, I yeah. was not committed to the fuck. That was back when they had all the pilot season and all that. That was yeah. a big fucking jerk off every year. You'd come out here and try to get on something. But, um, but anyways, dude, I wrap it up here, dude. Just no Christmas so out here. That's the only thing that pissed me off. I mean, I saw one tree that bothered me the year I lived here. I'm like, is everybody Jewish? There's like no nothing. I mean, we got the carols going back east now. Yeah. You know, man. Well, look, you can now you can skate. You can go skating. I don't know how they do this, especially with a fucking drought. Like right outside the oh, Staples Center, you can somehow go skating. And out in Santa Monica, they have something like every year. But uh, if you know where to go, there's a place in uh, Pasadena. Like this, this dude. It's it's like the sickest fucking houses you've ever seen. Where they actually have like, you know, oh, they really get into it, dude. It looks like Vanderbilt Rockefeller type oh, money. Shit, yeah. And they have these all these giant fucking trees that look like giant giant Christmas trees, and uh, I they're all fucking rich. So they just pay somebody to come in with like a crane, and they light up all of these. I call it like Christmas tree row or something, dude. Yeah. It's fucking insane it's it like illuminati like money and they allow you to go down this street once a year yeah and then you gotta fucking beat it but uh <laughs> before we get out of here dude you're one of my favorites of all time you're one of the Same great here, storytellers bro. as people could sell, uh, tell and, and this is a guy like don't sleep on pete Corielli's new special let me tell you it's streaming right now on show.com s-h-o 
dot com. Just click on comedy. His uh, he does an awesome uh, podcast with Sebastian, who's one of the best comics out there. Uh, who actually he must have told you he lived right down the hall from me when I lived in that shitty fucking one bedroom apartment. Did no, man, dude. Before I ever fucking before he ever did comedy, I ran into him. He's just this Chicago guy, and he goes, uh, "Hey, he's like you know, you know, Sebastian." When he doesn't know yeah. you, how he comes out, he goes, "Hey, you're." Uh, you're a comedian, right? Yeah. And I go, yeah, you know, I, I, oh, I'm all excited. So I recognize, oh, yeah. Oh, God, blah, blah, blah. And he just kind of nods me into shutting up. Like yeah. he sort of nodded and then I just sort of got quiet again. Yeah. He goes, yeah, yeah, I've seen you. I've seen you. Uh, yeah, I've been thinking um, thinking about doing it. You know, how do you uh, how do you go about that? And so I gave him, you know, some advice. and I kind of got to know him a little bit. Yeah. And then I moved away, like right after that. And like four or five years later, I'm coming out here, same type of jerk off thing, coming out here for a half hour special. I got a... F- pay my own way out here. I show up. I go on first at the comedy store. There's five people in the fucking crowd. I eat my balls. I'm addressing how there's only five people there and nobody's laughing. And then the guy who set up the fucking showcase gave me shit because there was nobody there. He goes, why'd you address it so many times? (laughs) He goes, we know there's nobody here. We're listening to the material. Yeah. I I, I, I I always wanted to go back in time and be like, hey, fuckhead, don't have a fucking showcase with no people in the fucking crowd. How about that? Yeah. How about I just paid all this fucking money and I can't. I'm still mad about that one. No, I hear you, man. So, anyways, yeah, so I went out there like fucking 2000, like three or four. And this was like the late 90s when I saw him. And I, I see this guy on stage. And I'm I, like, I recognize him, but I can't figure out where. And I go, what's this guy's name? And he goes, Sebastian. It's like, who do, I know one Sebastian my whole fucking life. Yeah. And I'm looking going, me too. I go, that's that fucking guy who lived down the hall from me. He's doing stand up. And that guy, he did the hardest thing ever. He started ground zero in Los yeah, Angeles. Yeah, that's like unheard of. It's practically impossible. It became a monster fucking comic who has an unbelievable work ethic and writes and, and like, and, I, I don't know. So anyways, Pete does a show with him on Riotcast. It's called the Pete and Sebastian Show on the Riotcast Network, which is www.riotcast.com. Uh, your Twitter is MyCorielli, C-O-R-R-E-A-L-E. Your website is www.petecorielli.com. Um, dude, you're one of my favorites. And if you Thank see this you. guy, go see him on the road. Go see his comedy specials. Dude. So great Bill, to run into Bill, you, man. I I'm in it. L.A. You're in Rochester. It never happens is, anymore. No, Buffalo area. I got to tell you one quick last thing. I was, right. uh, someone said to me, how's, how's stuff changed for you? And two days ago, my wife and I are raking my leaves in the front lawn, and a dude comes by and uh, looked really good. Did a nice job. But I swear to God, he looks at me, and he's like, you got a card? I oh, go, God. I go, no, I live here. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, he's like, oh, because you do. So it looks so fantastic. <laughs> That's it. Special comes out. Guy's asking me if I'll rate his goddamn leaves, Billy. <laughs> See, that's why Thank you got to watch his special. Thank you, man. It's been so great hanging with you, dude. Fucking. I, I imagine years, the next man. time I'll see you or something will be at some sort of uh, comedy festival, and uh, we gotta we gotta do it up the way we used to. Either that, or I'm coming to town. You're gonna give me a ride in that copter, bro. Oh, if you want to, I will. I'll take my chances, man. Yeah, dude, come on. Yeah, I'm not worried. Fun. I'm not worried. Dude, what sucks you. is we have it documented, too, because then, God forbid, something fucking happens. He said he wasn't worried. <laughs> All right, you guys, that's uh, that's the Thursday afternoon just before Monday, uh, just before Friday, Monday morning podcast. Thank you for listening. I'll talk to you on Monday. Have a good weekend, you cunts.